Andy, come back to the front as well, because uh, we've, we've plenty of time to, to open up, and that's part of what this morning's about. It's a chance to, uh, to discuss, to question, to uh, interact with one another. So um, we've had, well, shall we say quite provocative things, uh, but certainly very thought-provoking. Questions for Andy, for Richard, uh, contributions. Uh, this is your opportunity. Don't just, don't just uh, sit looking through binoculars. <laughs> uh, Richard is here, he's accessible, and uh, uh, this is Andy, and uh, we're all here together. So, somebody start the ball rolling. Yeah. I was just commenting if you both had thoughts on at what stage should the church be covering these issues with the young guy before he even signs up to Cornell or signs up to Third Mill? So, at what level should we be screening some of this stuff, asking these hard questions, and how? How messy or how cleaned up does a guy need to be for us to let to let him through? And do we sort of recognise it's going to be a bit messier, mm -hmm. even guys that we approve? Mm -hmm. You're your game. <laughs> it's your country. <laughs> you've got to start with what you've got. There's no point in wishing for <coughs> one of the things that I think puts us off training people is we think, well, I want to train somebody, but these don't. <laughs> Not these people. <laughs> I wish I had the leaders, and I wish I had the leaders that I don't have. You know that kind of thing. I wish I had the potential people that I don't have. Um, I personally think it's more helpful to to think first of all not not merely about where am I going to get my church leader from, mm -hmm. but where are who are the people in my congregation, and how can I develop them. Um, and that's a question that everybody's valuable. That's a question that needs to be applied to every area of church life. How can I take people on from where they are? And in the taking people on from where they are, people will emerge who will be able to extend their influence unusually. And that's really what church leaders are, isn't it? You're expecting people, people who, who by virtue of their character and personality and all kinds of things are able to extend their influence unusually in, in the lives of other people. Um, but I think it's, it's not helpful if you just, where are those people? Um, and neglect the others. They emerge out of an attitude which is looking for every, looking out for everyone. So uh, there may be some obvious ones in, in, in churches, and you do need to ask the hard questions, actually, because the people who look obvious sometimes are unusual in unhelpful ways, um, uh, unusually pushy or unusually uh, ambitious, or you know, people emerge, rise to the top visually for all kinds of reasons, not always good ones. And it is important to ask the difficult questions to the people who look prominent. Um, my experience in, in, in training people more broadly is that the very best leaders come from um, the not brilliant looking initially, middle ground, av average, average range of people. In every church, there'll be people who look fantastically competent at one end and fantastically incompetent at the other, and a vast mass of in-betweens. Most really reliable gospel workers, in my view, come from that vast mass of in-betweens. They don't know that they've got the aptitude, and neither do you, until you start to try and help and develop them. That's why what you were saying about, about it being about developing a a whole culture of training within the whole church is so important because um, it's not just looking out for <coughs> the elite <coughs> from the top, but it's, it's, it's the whole thing, Richard. Yeah, in, in my limited experience in the States, we, ha we had a serious problem in the, with the traditional school, and that was who was recommended to come. You did have to go through the formality of being recommended by your pastor. I mean, you had to do that, and you had to write a testimony of your conversion. But... Um, so sad how true this is. P 
people in the States would come to a theological school to find out if they were called by God to ministry. In other words, I could have gone to law school, I could have gone to medical school, my daddy will pay for all of that, or I can go to seminary. Seminary, well, maybe there I have a chance of finding out you know, where I am as a Christian and getting my problems fixed. And um, they had no sense of call. Now, when people came with, with problems, and they had a very strong sense of what we call in my tradition um, the internal call. Do you use that expression? Internal meaning, I can't, I've got to do this. Um, and the church has given at least a nominal external call to them, yeah, we think you probably can do this, Uh, then even if they had serious problems, they went after it. But the ones who came just sort of wondering, I don't know, you know, I kind of like Christianity, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my life. Let me explore this a little bit. It tended to bring the level down, and seminaries in the States didn't mind that at all because they needed those people. Do you know why they needed them so badly? Because people would come to me in conferences and say, oh, Dr. Pratt, Dr. Pratt, I've applied to Reformed Seminary. Uh, What do you think my chances are getting in? You know what I would do? Man, you're in. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry about it. So there has to be some of this screening, but it's a matter of, in my opinion, the drive, the call, not so much their perfection. Um, because that will then make them people who will, who will get in. And remember also that the word sanctifies us. So as they learn the word and they have that call of God on them, they're going to be sanctified. It will be a good thing for them. And that's a wonderful, the zeal is what we need them to have, yeah. in my opinion. Is that any help in yeah. relation to your question? Okay. It doesn't end right then either. The church continues to speak to those issues mm-hmm. in the man's life. Whereas in seminary, you send him off and hope they speak to it. You may never even tell them he has those problems. I think one of the one of the um, critical things about about the closeness of the partnership and training between mm-hmm. things that have to go on in a classroom by the nature of it and things that uh, can only be seen in, in the church is that is that you know there can be people who in the sort of didactic part of things, in the classroom type of things, can seem to be you know, the outstanding people, the, the top of the class people. But you know, there are issues which are fatal to ministry that, uh, that, you, that you're, not gonna, you're never going to see in the classroom, nor, or, or very rarely, but which will come to light in, in all that you've been talking about in terms of the, the, the nurture and, the, uh, and, and the, the, the real training that goes on in the life of the church. And um, traditionally, because so many of those things haven't been discovered, uh, people have been put out into ministry, and the car crash comes when they're actually in fully fledged ministry and perhaps in, 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 a, in a significant leadership position. And that's calamitous not only for them, but also for, uh, for churches. Uh, and so, you know, given all that Richard said, I mean, I, I, I would have thought that what it means is that as part of our process of training, a very important and necessary, not a failure of that, but a success of that, is that there are going to be Vetting. failures. Vetting. Or, 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 there's going to be people who are, you know, there's going to be a sifting process. Mm-hmm. You know, in my denomination, again, I'm, I can only talk about my dad's tie, okay? I'm not going to talk about your dad's tie. But in my denomination, we put people through seminary and we ordain them and they become pastors. And they've never led a single person to Christ. Does that feel counterintuitive to you? I mean, never. They don't know the name of a poor person. They've never seen, a, they've never been involved in a family splitting up. They've never been with a family where an infant has died. They've, nev- they've never seen someone take their last breath. Never. Never seen a person take their last breath. Not all of you in pastorate, how many times have you done that by now? Okay? Welcome to real ministry. And let me tell you, if evangelism is not in your heart by the time you go through your theological education and get into pastorate, it's not going to get into your heart later on. It's got to get into you now. It's got to be in your DNA that when you see somebody, you're thinking, I need to bring them to Christ, and I'll do whatever it takes for me to make the best effort I possibly can. It's got, to be, it's got to be a part of your DNA. And that's where we've got to get our future leaders for the sake of Scotland, 
for the sake of the United States, we have got to get them there and stop, stop ordaining them when they have not brought anyone to Christ, when they don't know a poor person, when they haven't seen someone die, when they've never carried a bedpan their whole lives. So That's part of theological education, it seems to me. Bedpan management. Right. Yeah, bedpan management. Well, well, I love it. Um, <laughs> you, you, you talked about um, wanting to, to give yourself to the necessary change in how to do, how, how we train leaders, how we do leadership development and so on. Could you say something about the, about the great issue of accreditation? Yes, I'd be glad to. That's the thing that constantly I find that uh, the young men think about ministry are saying, well, who will recognize me? Uh-huh. And, and what they mean is, you know, which, which bit of paper can I have that will be will come off the door to the job that Andy's talking about? Yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a real issue. It's a real issue. You're a young guy coming through wanting to, you know, you've got a... You've got a You've got a livelihood, you've got a family, you've got a job, you're going to give it all up because you believe that you really want to give yourself to this. But, what, you know, who's going to put bread on my plate? Who's going to recognize my trade? It's all very well to have all this rhetoric. But what about that? Because it's a, it's a, it's a big issue to put Let me tell you what one father of the PCA said to me. After actually two or three have said it over the years, but he said, you, he, this is one of the founders. He said, when young men used to visit a church to explore the possibility of taking that pulpit, he said, the, at the last thing they would ever talk about or ever discuss or bring up was the salary. In other words, the question was, do you fit with us? Do you fit with our vision? What kind of person are you? Do we like your wife? Does she play the piano? Those kinds of things, okay? <laughs> okay? All the way down. And then finally, at the end of the process, if all those things fit, then money was talked about. And he says, now, the first thing that comes up in telephone conversations with a potential candidate is, how much is the salary that you're offering? Now, let's face it, we all need to eat, as you say. You've got to put bread on the table, okay? But I think that um, what we really want to do is to get the fire in their bellies, the fire in their hearts that say, I'm called to ministry, and I'm going to do this, and I know it's going to be sacrificed, and my spouse knows it's going to be sacrificed, and we are going to do it. It's just a question of how God makes that possible. Now, frankly, that is what happened with me when I left Reformed Seminary. It was the easiest, and I was paid so much money you wouldn't believe it, okay, to do third mill. It was, I'm not worried about the money. We're going to do this. If I have to get another job, we'll get another job. We'll do whatever it takes. And that, has, that is indicative of the decline of my denomination. Can you see that? Even to plant a church in the United States, in my denomination, you won't believe this. Before you can be approved by Presbytery to plant a church, you have to have in promise, at least, nearly a half million dollars. It costs us a half million dollars to try to start a church. Half of our uh, church plants fail. Which means every time, every time you start a church, you're rolling a million dollar dice. Let's see. million dollars. So what does that tell you about how many churches you can start? A presbytery is doing wonderfully if it does two churches a year. And two churches a year, we are getting deeper and deeper in the hole every single day. We're losing ground every single day. So there's a part of this that really people, these young men who are rising in leadership in my country, perhaps yours too, need to sort of say, um, it's up to God to accredit me. Thank you very much. Okay? And if the Lord is on me and the church will recognize that, I will serve the church in what capacity it calls me to. Now, see, because you know their wives too, you're going to work with them too. Can't have them in different places on this kind of an issue. But that's the fire we need if we're going to see revival come to Scotland. Okay, so there's a, but there's a, there's a, you're talking about the responsibility on those wanting to go into ministry. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm, uh, but I'm, going, I'm coming. What about, what about the church too? Yeah, we, okay. We so here's the big question for me. What in the world are we thinking in my country, 
universities don't accredit ministry degrees, okay? Um, rather, that's done by an external society that's run by Roman Catholics and liberal Protestants. Did you hear what I just said? ATS, the Association of Theological Schools, which is the mother of all accrediting agencies for theological schools in the United States, is run by, whom did I say? Roman Catholics and liberal Protestants. So they accredit the curricula of theological education, including mine, that is, um, Arch- Reformed Seminary, Covenant Seminary, Westminster Seminary, our kinds of people, okay? Grace, Talbot, whatever you want to name, Trinity. Um, what I believe in is that accreditation should come from the church. You are the ones who know what these people need to know and be and how they need to be. The, skill, the knowledge they need, the skills they need, and the personal spiritual life that they need. You're the one that knows that. And you're the one that ought to say, we approve, check, we approve, check, we don't approve. We like, we think Cornhill, Scotland, yep. We think PTC, yep. We do not think Scotland, Cornhill, Scotland, X. We do not think PTC, X. You're the one that should be deciding this. Not some university council. I really do believe that. Let's say a little bit about that. I, mean, I, I work, worked in independent churches mainly. Some of you are struggling with denominational constraints. You cannot employ somebody in your church unless approved by somebody else. Um, some ob- observations from the independent pond. Uh, we um, both trained and sent into ministry and employed significant number of people over a 13, 14 year period in our church by far the most successful appointments to staff posts in our church were people who had been trained in our church sent away for you know the icing on the cake stuff and brought back in by far the external appointments were always complicated they didn't know us we didn't know them. They didn't know what they were getting. We didn't know what we were getting. Uh, training your own people, or people you already know, with other, you know, not every church is a has the you know, footfall to be able to just train a whole series of people. But you can get together with others who you trust mm. and know. Mm. But I just want to underline. <clears throat> Churches are accrediting bodies. Congregations are accrediting bodies, theologically speaking. If you approve that this person is okay to work in your church, then approve them. Train them for what you need them to do. Um, And I mean, I know the denominational thing is complicated. That's complicated. But employing your own guys is... is, (coughs) on the whole, a wonderful freedom. May I give a, a measure of, com- of comfort at this moment? Um, when we developed the third millennium curriculum, we developed it specifically and particularly to make sure that it matched the accrediting standards of ATS, the mother of all theological accreditors in the United States. Um, that meant in terms of the credentialing of the people that wrote the scripts, the people that are on the screen. Do you follow what I'm saying? They have the right academic curricula, uh, credentialing. Also, the number of contact hours. So, third millennium's curriculum, just by itself, um, is, the, is accreditable, if you heard what I'm saying. We did not seek accreditation with ATS. We could, but we didn't. But, to, show, to demonstrate that this is true, another accrediting agency, a large one, it's like number two in the United States for the- theological schools. <laughs> it's going to sound weird, but I'll go ahead and say it. They came to us. And they invited us to be accredited by them. Does that make sense? Uh, that's just to let you know, to give you a little confidence that what, we're, what we do at Third Mill, and I know what they do in the Cornhill part of this partnership, it's not theology light. It is as serious as it can be. Now, will you learn as many Latin phrases? Probably not. Okay? 
but do you use those in the pulpit anyway? They didn't answer. But you'll learn the concepts. In other words, at Third Mill, we work hard to make it understandable. But at the same time, it is, it is as I said, two and a half to three times as much data. And so I think you can be rest assured one day, probably, I don't know, we're still debating it internally, we will probably go ahead and go through the accrediting process with this organization. But it's not because we feel like we need to, because we don't even care. And they invited us to do this, not the other way around. We didn't seek them. So I think with the combination that you, you know the integrity of the Cornhill program. It's phenomenal. You do not know us probably very well. So as you start thinking about those two things mixing together, you say, what is this third mill? That's kind of the wild card here. Okay. Is this Richard Pratt's worldwide teaching ministry? No. We have 357 faculty people in third millennium. And they are from every ethnicity you can name. They are from a variety of evangelical denominations. So it's not super Calvinist stuff. We call our curriculum Calvinism with a thick velvet glove. Okay, and we make sure that if another, if there's been long-standing differences among tra evangelical traditions, denominations, we make sure that they are able to represent themselves. So, in other words, I don't have Ligon Duncan talking about Al Mohler. Okay, Al Mohler, Baptist, Southern Baptist, you know that name? Yeah. Okay, I, Al Mohler talks about Al Mohler. Okay, um, John Piper talks about John Piper. Not Richard Pratt. Then again, Al Mohler doesn't talk about Ligon either. You hear the difference? Martin, do you want to have questions, folks? So, yeah, I was just thinking fine. practically about, you know, in terms of the argument about is the church that accredits the individual. Um, I think that is quite a big shift of mindset for a church. And um, I think it's hard for me to envisage the church I'm at, for example, having that mindset. Now, we're in a denomination, and so there is that denominational culture of there's this place that, is it, that people get trained. So there is perhaps where we, it's going to be harder to shift that culture at the church I'm in than maybe some independent evangelical churches. But I, I find it hard to imagine shifting that mindset. So then, but I'm also thinking it's an extra step. I've got, if I've got a guy at Cornhill and they're thinking ministry and I'm thinking ministry and we're thinking as a church ministry for them further training, I'm not just thinking, does my church have that mindset? I've got to be confident that where I recommend they go next, other churches across Scotland will recognise that. And so I don't have the confidence that, you know, there, it's, it's, it's a huge sea change across a lot of churches that, that I feel we don't have mm -hmm. for me to have the confidence to say, oh, go to PTC, mm -hmm. yes, you won't get a certificate, but um, people will know that you're a good guy, because I'll tell them you're a good guy, and they'll tell them you're a good guy, so just do it. I just, I, I, at the moment, I struggle with yeah. how far we are from that. Yeah. The same in the PCA, I can tell you. Happily, however, over the last eight, eight years, I guess, well, now we have five presbyteries in the PCA that now adopt, have approved candidates using third millennium. Yeah, okay, but it's because people like you stood up and said, well, what we need is this man, not the imprimatur of a school. Um, and there's a person in this room, I won't point him out right now, who has successfully broken the pattern, okay, in a denomination here in Scotland because of the gifts that God has given him who went through PTC, oh, pardon me, yeah, PTC and Cornhill, okay, and he did not have the formal education, uh, and, and what I want to say is, okay, maybe he can't go to another church in your denomination. So he goes out and starts a church. How about that? How about you need more good churches in Scotland rather than just filling the pulpits of ones that have passed away? There is definitely a credibility <laughs> issue, and we recognize that. And can I say, folks, we're not, we're not, we haven't got you here today to beat you over their head and say, come and join, <laughs> come and join in with this. <coughs> What we would, not, would encourage you to do, however, is not discount the product just because, at the moment, not everybody knows what it is or recognises what it is. We recognise that we're doing something alternative and not immediately recognisable all across Scotland, especially because Scotland has been so denominationally constrained in terms of its training. 
that it's a big, you know, we're aiming at a big thing <laughs> um, and, a, and a significant shift. Um, I suppose it's true over the last 12 years that as people have been through Cornhill and are now serving in churches and leading churches, um, the product is, if you like, beginning to be understood more widely. The lag time with PTC will be longer than that because the numbers will be smaller and the reach will be smaller initially. Um, so I completely understand, completely understand that. And you want to do what's good for your guys in terms of where they're going to be going next. Um, we do, however, need loads and loads and loads of new churches. Loads of new churches all over Scotland. Churches are shutting. Church buildings are being shown. So congregations have emerged. Church buildings are being sold off left, right and centre. We need loads of new churches. And finding ways of doing that within or without our denominations is a big issue for us if we're aiming for the nation to be reached again. Yeah, mm. Martin, come in. Well, I had another question about... <laughs> Is that all right? So yeah. moving on from the accreditation <coughs> thing. I mean, it's just about, I suppose, looking at, inviting you to speak into this, really. So basically, I, you know, had three years residential training, very thankful to God for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you've said today resonates with me about when theological training residentially is not done well, mm -hmm. and it's not thinking about the whole of the person. Mm -hmm. But I think in lots of ways, Oak Hill College, where I trained, yeah. is thinking about the whole of the person Absolutely. and just bringing them a member of staff in the summer to do to pastorally mm -hmm. nurture students there because they're recognising some of the issues mm -hmm. you've identified. Mm -hmm. In ministry day to day or, or week on week now, I just I'm struck by the complexity of some of the issues that I grapple with. For example, <coughs> number of guys at St Silas engaging with Tom Wright. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of stuff going on there. People who studied under Tom Wright at St Andrews mm -hmm. who are arriving keen. But there's a lot of stuff to unravel there under the surface. And I'm very thankful that there are these building blocks that I'm not getting out my lecture notes from college, but the stuff there that was put there that I, at the moment, struggle to believe I would have, I would have been equipped for one day a week for three years. But I had five days a week um, for three years. And... and, and I think about some of the stuff you've talked about in terms of the secularisation of our country and the challenge to re-evangelise. Do we not therefore need more intensive theological training for people on issues like presuppositional apologetics to confront where people are thinking, not just today but in 20 years' time, rather than a day a week while in a church where they're going to be overwhelmed by pastoral stuff? In my, yeah. my opinion, yeah. you're absolutely right. We need more, not less. We need more effective and um, more successful data transfer, shaping the brain, as it were, of our students, even than we do in a normal residential <coughs> school, frankly. For, for the very reasons you named. If you'd asked me what I think the critical issues are in, on your island here, you named one of them. I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say it explicitly. You just let's do it. I'll say it. <laughs> you said it. Yeah, but um, I'm trying not to critique. You know, talk about your time. Um, but um, but absolutely, I'm all into it, and that's why that's why I can tell you that the um, third millennium curriculum deals with things like let's just say critical critical scholarship on the Bible. Okay, we act, we deal with it all the time in our lessons and respond to it in ways that people can get, but not after spending a week reading a chapter in a book that and still going, what? Okay, but rather, it's amazing how true this is. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The style of the teaching, the medium, the media of the teaching um, at Third Mill makes the acquisition easy. And um, it's just remarkable. I hate to tell you this. You know how we say a picture's worth a thousand words? Do you say that? Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, imagine what a good 3D animation is worth. Conceptually, how it shapes the conceptual, especially of younger students. 
Now remember, we're all old in the, not everybody, but most of us are old in this room, okay? So we are, we're used to reading books, we're used to doing traditional scholarship, that kind of thing. But the people that are rising up as leaders in your church now, that's not their world. They didn't grow up in that world. They grew up in the world of iconography, of video games and things like that. That's their universe. And that is the way their brains have been shaped, and that's how they learn. Now, they need to be taught how to read. There's no doubt about that. You hear me say that? But if you're trying to do it hard, and you're trying to do it fast, and you're trying to get major concepts into them, um, you're going to have to accommodate the learning style that's here now, just like Paul did, just like they did when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, and okay, so on and so forth. Okay, it's all in the Bible. I'm not making this up. It's in the Bible. And so... Um, I, I agree with you. I think we need more than you get in a traditional three-year um, residential school. Um, now, when he says one day, what he means by that is they're requiring that of them, okay? And it is, they have to protect them from the church in that sense. But it's more than that. It's the two, it's the two years prior. It's the one day only. In, and then they have these week-long things. Like, I was here this week, and they watched <coughs> third millennium videos on the prophets, they came having answered questions, taken tests on these videos. I mean, they took tests on these videos before that was their ticket to get into the room. And when they walked into the room, I knew what they knew. I knew how, they were we're ready to go. And so now I'm in their lives. I'm in their life. Was I in your life, Josh? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> all the time. Because see, I knew Josh, I didn't knew Josh's name, and I knew that he's working with the Iranian congregation here. And we're talking about prophets with respect to them and prophets with respect to their personal lives, that kind of thing. Um, so it was, it was not conceptually light. It was heavier than what I was able to do at Reform Seminary when I taught a semester on Isaiah to Malachi. This is, Can I just, just before going, this is an important issue because it is related to accreditation. Accreditation is, yeah. well, other people recognize this, but this is about, uh, you know, and if we say, okay, but it's the church you should recognize, the question now is, well, do we even really believe it? Do we believe it's enough? Is it anything like? Yeah, I don't even think it's enough, right? <laughs> but uh, so, uh, Andy, can I say a little bit about that? There is no doubt in working the PCC model, curric curriculum selection has been the biggest challenge. We know that we've got much less contact time than would be normal in a full-time residential thing. Uh, the biggest challenge has been to select material for home study that gets people as quickly and sophisticatedly into the heart of a major theological theme and a big contemporary issue in that thing. That's been very hard work and remains the biggest challenge. Um, what I would say on that is that we have tended to do, um, you'll find details on, uh, exa example details on the, on the material. We've tended in the course of PTC to do quite a lot of work on broad doctrinal themes, but have, in the course of doing that broad doctrinal theme, a very sharp focus in some detail on a particular <coughs> contemporary issue relating to that theme. Uh, and the sharp focus is meant to get students able to uh, deal with contrary arguments, explore people's arguments and stuff. So, for example, on the soteriology unit, we devote significant time at the moment to um, new perspective stuff and, and, and T. Wright because that not just generally but in Scotland in particular <laughs> uh, is, um, is an ongoing issue um, one of the things that we we hope long term is that as issues arise we will still do the broad brushstroke on that theological field, but we'll pick different, we'll pick different contemporary issues to zoom in on. Now, it's it's a it's a it's a balancing act. We um, we lose on contact time. I think we gain with that um, flipping the classroom thing. I think we gain in. Uh, rapidity of acquisition of information about stuff and getting quickly to processing thoughts on stuff. So, for example, um, we had a guy uh, who uh, was part of the um, pastor's training course a few years ago who flew up from Bristol every two weeks. It was cheaper for him uh, to get from Bristol from his job than uh, to do 
PTC here than it had been for him to do Cornell in London, which he did from Bristol. We were doing the soteriology unit, work on New Perspective and Tom Wright. He gave a presentation of that back in his church in Bristol, and his pastor, who had been to formal theological college and was well acquainted with the issues, said, that is the clearest, sharpest presentation I've ever heard on that subject. So I think it's possible to do um, by virtue of a model of um, home data download and classroom processing. It's possible to do much more quickly and in a more focused manner stuff that would take you a long time were you following the traditional model. Now, that does not mean we cover all that we do not, and indeed we do not aim to cover all, um, all the bases because we are aiming for a program of education that goes on, that starts now and goes on forever and that people keep buying into beyond the course. But just because we ain't got much contact time doesn't mean, you know, we've got one day, one day in class every two weeks and two days of study every two weeks. It does not mean the takeaway is a fifth of the size. Um, we get, I think we get more out of it. I think we do. Time will tell with that, whether that's really true. But I think we get more out of it than you would get yeah, yeah. in the standard yeah. model. Yeah. Um, a lot of work goes into the curriculum selection for the home study. Of all the things I could get people to read or listen to, what is the thing... <coughs> that will prime it as well as possible. That has been the big investment of time and energy. And that's just an ongoing search for stuff that's sharp and clear and comprehensive and stuff like that. So that's a, re it's a legitimate concern, though, obviously, because we're, we are deliberately not doing all day every day. Yeah. But with the evolution of the involvement of all the, the range of the third row material, we have <coughs> got a very wide range that does include... Yeah. Everything we'll plus and stuff. There's a chapter in Hermann Ritterbos's poem on his theology entitled Ne Erwartum. Great. Okay, and so students would spend weeks reading that chapter and not have a clue what it said afterwards, even when the professor tried to explain it to him, because he's also up there. Okay? So this is now the testimony of students, okay, that began to use our Paul course. Okay, in Reform Seminary. And um, students have spent a week trying to understand that chapter, which is a fabulous chapter. Um, he looked, they come to us and they say, in three minutes of this animation, I understood the chapter. And I said, well, okay, praise the Lord, because that's what we want. Because you can make it hard, or you can make it simple, you can get right to it, or you can just go all around it. And that's the goal. The goal is efficiency, effectiveness, and, re and uh, retention. That's the goal. And whether we succeed or not, I guess you'd have to just explore that. Maybe take a look at some of it or something. Yeah. Can I say that we're not? Just have, can I say we're not aiming to point the finger out there at no, things not at other all. things. Anything anyone can get from anywhere that's good is good. <laughs> um, don't hear, please don't hear us saying that we are saying anything else is rubbish. It's just that we think this model works well for, potentially, for Scotland now and longer term. Yeah. One of the, one of the, this continues, Martin, to your point a little bit. Some years ago, um, we looked at what we were going to do with uh, somebody or, or people in terms of um, additional training, perhaps, beyond Cornhill. And we looked at um, whether, whether it would work for us to send people to, to Oak Hill. Um, and the reason we looked there was for all the reasons you're mm. you're saying. It's fabulous. Um, and the simple fact was we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford it for one person, let alone for six people. And the simple reality of affordability and practicality is is you know where the rubber hits the road uh, for us. Um, and I think that's the reality for for most churches. Um, and this model has allowed us to. <coughs> Um, pay for and to train people that just we, we would not be able to uh, to do in other ways in other ways that we consider good enough training 
Um, and so, 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 so that's a very practical thing, um, but it's been a, a kind of determining, a determining thing for us. We've got Terry here at the back, and then... Um, um, and here in the front, too. Here. Sorry. <coughs> I'm talking today about the, the real need to re-evangelise uh, re our, our nation, and then, you know, so therefore, folks, I think, need to come from every part of our nation uh, to help us in that, in that goal. Um, you, you made a funny point about, you know, if you've got a pulse, then you're in. Uh, but I don't think that's true, is it? Um, there are some barriers in, in your country, talking about your family, uh, for folks to access seminary education. Could maybe you speak yes. about some of those? Number one barrier, money. Yeah. Number two barrier, formal education. Number three barrier, language. The United States is not doing well, evangelicalism isn't, but it would be really going down if it were not for the large, the fastest growing um, demographic of evangelicals in the United States who are Spanish speaking. Bang! And what are our seminaries doing for Spanish speakers? I nada. I nada. Seminaries that are established in what we call, margar lovingly, Margaritaville. Okay, in Spanish-speaking cities in the United States, Miami, Orlando, half of Orlando speaks Spanish only, um, my, Manhattan. There are 1.2 million people in Manhattan that self-report to the census of the United States that they speak Spanish at home and do not speak English well. And what are we doing for them as evangelicals, as reformed, in my opinion, in my view, in my case, evangelicals? The, the answer is, I nada, I nada, I nada. Es terrible. But you know that that was not the case at Pentecost. Yep. Okay, so should we have a Farsi curriculum here in Edinburgh? Should you? Yes or no? What do you think? Do you not want one? <laughs> so where are you going to get it? I know where. Okay. Um, Okay, so language is a barrier, but of course Pentecost says language should not be a barrier, yes? Is that correct? Is it, you understand what I'm saying? Okay, it's very really interesting. What about formal education? Well, in the States you've got to have a uni degree, a bachelor's degree, or you can't get in. All right, well I think it's interesting, isn't it, that Paul, who had a PhD, is not the preacher at Pentecost. It's Peter, who was a fisherman, never went to high school, who could not write Greek well enough even to write his own epistles, had to have Sylvanus do it. You follow me? Okay? It's, that's how bad his Greek was as a fisherman living in Galilee. And, uh, but he's the preacher at Pentecost. I can tell you right now that there are people even in this room who did not have the formal qualifications to get into a theological school who have the fire of the gospel in them and who do know, have learned enough theology to be able to do ministry and to do it in orthodoxy. You don't have to have an undergraduate degree, what we call undergraduate degree, in order to do this. In fact, it's a barrier. In certain, country, in certain states in the United States, the majority Christian population is African American. And their pastors have high school education, period. They're not going to go for more. No thank you very much. But their theology is horrible. Horrible! And why? Because they can't get into a good evangelical theological school. They don't have a uni degree. It's, right? So Pentecost is against that too, in my opinion. Third major barrier, remember what it was? M-O-N-E-Y. -E all right, well, you know what happened on Pentecost. Next week, what do they have to do? Deal with all the poor people in the church. Do you really think money ought to be an obstacle? Money ought not be an obstacle for theological education. It ought to be a non-issue. And I, that's why biblical education for the world for free for us is very important. Okay? They free, you can have everything you want from third mill for absolutely free. I mean, we're, we know that Bible verse, freely you receive, so charge them as much as possible. <laughs> Remember that one? So yeah, those are barriers, and we've got to bring those barriers down. We which, have to. Which is why I'm thankful that it was a local church, it's the local church that puts their hands on men. That's right. Because for all the reasons that you gave, I would not be in ministry today. Yeah, we need people in the schemes around here, okay? Not just one or two. We need a lot of them, a lot of church leaders in the schemes. Am I using the word correctly? Okay. Okay, well, let me just tell you something. With rare exception, a uni-educated, and then three more years, okay, 
Oxford educated three more years, they're going to have a hard time in the schemes. Fair enough? Okay? So um, we've got to get people whose heart is in the schemes to get to the schemes. But we've got to provide them with a solid theological, biblical understanding. We've got to do that. But that's the goal. And I'll tell you, you know the Bible says this. You know that Paul says this. Not many are sophisticated. Not many are rich. Not many are the upper class. You want to reach Scotland? That's who you've got to reach. Won't that be great? See this place just turned upside down like that. It'll be so fantastic. And it's great when it's great when numbers of different uh, groupings and institutions are seeking to do that. We we, we want to encourage that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Terry, do you want to come back on that at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have any formal education. I left school with nothing. Um, with other guys in this room, kind of, I left school with nothing, and um, the church recognised gifts that we had, calling that we had. Um, and through the model that's offered at Cornwall and PTC, we were sufficiently trained with that. I, I don't hold a pastoral position for a church today, but I'm working in the, the, the ever-increasing um, exposed social phenomenon that we witness, an, an addiction. Um, um, and the training that I've received at PTC and Cornwall has helped formalise my thinking to be able to go into the world to teach the world what the Bible says about their addiction. Not what the world says about their addiction, but what the, what the Bible says um, about their addiction. Um, and I wouldn't have been able... I, 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 there was so many barriers for me to access, you know, other forms of education. Um, <coughs> so it's not a one size You know, people are not saying here the day, what like PTC, Cornhill... Where everybody needs to get on board with it. Mm-hmm. But if we're gonna reach if we're gonna reach Scotland then the <coughs> seminary education in America is imploding because it costs money to put people through it. And the money's the money's no there, there's no an ever increasing amount of money. Um, and it's limited. I mean where do Spanish people go in America for they a don't. church? They don't. They don't have a guy in the pulpit that they can relate to. Or they go to liberal seminaries <coughs> that uh, will pay their way. Or Benny Hinn on TV. Or Benny Hinn on TV. <coughs> so, it's important in America. It's, it's breaking up. It's, it is. Know, so, Thanks. there needs to be other ways to be training. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Angus, one. Yeah, a couple of things that got on my mind. I, I'm very stimulated and encouraged by what I'm hearing today. I, I am involved on the board about a fairly traditional seminary in a city not that far from here. <laughs> um, so I, I know that there is there value in intense yeah. training, but the danger of the monastery is always yeah. is always in it, especially if you're five, six, seven stories above sinners, which <coughs> can happen. You look down and sinners literally. Yeah. And, and <coughs> So I, I like the rootedness in the church idea of what I'm hearing. What I'm wanting to ask about is where do you get your ecclesiology in a formal kind of way? Where do you get your early church history, your Reformation history? Because these same heresies and battles haven't gone away. If anything, <coughs> you know, Gnosticism is very relevant. That's right. That's we, right. All of that. yeah. So you know, yeah, okay. how do you keep the gold standard? Yeah. The other question yeah. is, nuts and bolts, what does it cost yeah. to maybe have a six-year training or something like that? Yeah, okay. On the first, um, as with all the stuff we're doing, we have to be selective with curriculum. Um, we do, at the moment, have a Christology model uh, module which is developed around um, the 4th and 5th century debates, but not left there. So we do a lot of work on joining up, well, if this is the shape of your Christology, what are the human implications of thinking that way? What are the soteriological implications of thinking that way now? So that's a that's a model that we self-consciously take from a um, 
church history and histor historical theological perspective. We can't do that with all the mod with all the modules that we're doing, but we're trying to do that <coughs> some of the time for some of them. And the third mill modules cover <coughs> the third mill history and all these things. Yeah, the third mill is it's almost embarrassing to say this, but the third mill curriculum is high, highly traditioning. Yeah. If that makes sense, to use my term would be traditioning, what you're talking yeah. about, um, connecting them to the historical church. Yeah. But let me also add this. Those PCA presbyteries that have approved candidates um, using third mill, they, the way we describe it is third mill plus. And the plus is the specifics that are denominationally um, required and needed, mm -hmm. like the history of the PCA, the, um, the book <coughs> of church order, all those kinds of things that are necessary. And that can be done on top of an association with a sort of generic curriculum like we have done. But so so that's, where the, that's where the church part of the third right. triad comes in, I guess, because we have people, we're, we're collaborating on the 95% of stuff that is the same, whether you're ecclesiology as Presbyterian or Episcopalian or independent <coughs> or whatever it is. <coughs> because there's a clear partnership with the church, that's where the, that's where the church is going. That happens in different ways depending on which... Yeah. And cost for training? We were totting it up yesterday. If somebody does the full five years, Cornhill over two and PTC over three, currently the cost is about 13,000. Um, it's we have not yet got to the stage where we are think we've had all that much time and energy to go after um, non-student funding to make it run. We view that as a medium and long-term goal to get ourselves to the stage financially where we are not dependent on student numbers in order to make things run. We long to be able to do the for free thing um, in terms of energy and time and stuff, we're, we're just not at that point yet. But it, it is, we, we hope to make it cheaper rather than more expensive in the long term. Can I just clarify? That's just, that's just course fees, isn't it? There's five years of church salary on, to go, yeah. to go on site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, there's church, the first two years will be apprenticeships, where yeah. churches will vary yeah. in what they do. Some pay the apprentices, some they find their own grants, some yeah. it's a combination of those. But the th the three year PTC, yes, you're right. It is a it is, it is churches investing in yeah. training positions, and that and that is I think that is the biggest <coughs> that's yeah. the biggest obstacle and difficulty because it's all part of this culture of churches actually realizing that um, they if we're going to train people, it's not going to happen for free. Yeah. If there's going to be theological education for the world for free, it's not really free. Somebody's paying for what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. People who have got vision yeah. to put money into, into yeah. training. But what I find, all I can speak about is our church uh, set up, is that it's a whole lot easier for a church to understand and to raise, uh, raise its game in terms of giving money to train somebody that they can still see and who's working in amongst them and who's actually, in their view, giving something to the church than raising even more money than that costs to send them away far away and never to see them for three years. Or again. Or ever again. And that's, that's certainly what we've found. So it's not easy doing that. It's very easy. It's not easy getting your first apprentice. That's really hard. Our people thought, what on earth is this? We've never heard of this. What crazy idea is this? After two or three years, they thought, what a great idea they've always had to have apprentices. And uh, wasn't it great we persuaded our ministry to do this? When you then want to start having your first paid training person, you go through the same whole thing again. Ooh, well, well, what about all this? After a while, as long as you have good ones, you'll say, we would never want to stop this. This is terrific. So as with anything in ministry, the truth is 95, if not 98% of your people can never see anything different the way it's always been. And so one of the greatest tasks in all Christian leadership is pushing boulders uphill against all the inertia and the weight of people's inability to see things. But if you keep going, you do get to the top of the hill, and the boulder begins to roll down, and eventually the vast majority of your people who are good-hearted people do see because they catch up with the vision. There's always a few who never will. But the, the, 
you'll have all seen it in, in church life in all sorts of different ways. People don't see it in advance. But part of leadership is seeing in advance and being able to take yeah. people and stick it out to the point where eventually they can, they can see it with you. Can I just say, I think undoubtedly, humanly speaking, the biggest rate-limiting step in Scotland to the training of people for pastoral ministry is the availability of the training assistant minister role in churches. And there are denominational reasons for that. That's not been the predominant model in our big denominations, that it's normal to have in your congregation a training assistant minister who will be there for three or four or five years and then be going on to something else and then the next one will come in and so on. Um, the, the biggest thing we lack organisationally is churches with that role who are just serially, let's have another one, let's send them on, let's have another one, let's send them on. Um, that's, a big, that's a big issue in our culture um, and a big limiter. So, this is the last question because I promised we would finish by answering. So I'll have a concise answer. How do you see training opportunities present themselves for those who are bivocational, by, by call? So that in full-time work, they would love to do call yeah. hill, but that's not, but we'll really want training at the same time. What's the opportunity? There are opportunities for church planting. You know, need for more church plants. It needs to be practical. Yes, it needs yes, to it be does. affordable. Yes, so people does. can support themselves in these areas. How do they get good training at the same time? Uh, it's always difficult to do stuff around the edges. If you're doing, trying to do two things at once, it's always hard. Um, I think there's no doubt that nationally we need a lot more, we need many more bivocational people. Amen. People who are seriously joined up theologically and ministry-wise, but can basically fund themselves or part fund themselves with the help of others. We just need to do that and to make that happen. Now, we're not, we're not ideally set up for that yet. If loads of churches came to us and said, look, you need a bivocational stream. You need to make your program do that. We'll listen to you um, and try and do that. Um, we do have some people. We do have some people who, who have who've been far enough on in their work to be able to squeeze their shifts into one half of the week one year, and then into the other half of the week the other year to do it. We we are prepared to be flexible if the if the demand is there. If you are things you need and would work for you, please don't hesitate to say. Nobody is going to be uh, forced to leave. There's plenty of time to stay as long as you like and ask more questions and talk to these guys. But I did promise we'd, uh, we'd finish four minutes. So I want to, to, to draw us to a close. Uh, to thank uh, Andy and Richard uh, particularly for... Uh, for all their input to us. Thank all of you for, for being here. Please yeah. uh, please do come and still ask questions and, uh, and chat. Uh, this, this, we can be here all day if you want to. Uh, but uh, I'm going to ask uh, Colin Adams, who's our, our local chair of our gospel partnership, to, to close us in prayer for Colin. Father, we thank you so much for what Andy and Richard have shared with us today. Uh, thank you for the double mercy that we've received the mercy not only of salvation but of serving in ministry. We thank you for the stimulation of this morning, for shaking up our thinking, for pressing home to us again the role you've given us, not just to pastor and preach but to train. Forgive us for those times when we've just got our head down and ploughed our own furrow. Help us to be like Paul. Help us to put training at the top of our agenda. Thank you for what Richard has shared. Thank you that his family is not so different from ours, that we have a lot in common. And we pray that you will help us to execute our culture and our scenario here in Scotland. Show us the blind spots. Show us the ways that we need to do things differently. We do pray, Lord, you will especially help us to focus on developing our character and the character of those around us, not just their competence. And we pray, Lord, for Cornhill. We thank you for it. We thank you for your blessing upon it over these years. We thank you for third millennium and for this wide-ranging, worldwide vision. And we thank you for the fact that this is still developing. May these ministries flourish and go from strength to strength. 
And we pray, Lord, indeed, that we would see each of our churches too as training centres. So would you help us to take that vision back to our churches, our leadership teams, help us to percolate these things, think them through, and we pray, Lord, that this will be to the blessing of your kingdom and your kingdom growth here in Scotland, here in the UK, and indeed throughout the world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.